Successful Aging in Canada, Findings from the Canadian Longitudinal Study, will be presented by Dr. Mabel Ho. Uh, Dr. Ho is a registered social worker who has worked in the field of gerontological social work for over 20 years. She's recently She recently completed her PhD in social work at the University of Toronto's Factor Inwintosh uh, Faculty of Social Work. Her research and practice interest focuses on the health and well-being of older adults. So I would like to welcome uh, Mabel here now and uh, all of you participants. All uh, There's almost 130 today um, for this exciting webinar. I turn it over to you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Mabel. Um, today, I'm going to talk about successful aging in Canada, findings from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, CLSA. Um, perhaps I will start the presentation by telling you a bit more about myself. Um, I'm a social worker by training, and for the past over 20 years, I had a privilege to work with um, older adults um, who have had a stroke, um, a dementia, and other chronic diseases, um, and their family members. Um, over the years, um, I, I thought, well, perhaps we can provide the best um, care, long-term care, all kinds of uh, support to them. But are there any things uh, we can do to better support them? Um, so that's why I, I want to look into um, how we can better support older adults to, um, to live well and age well. Um, so for the study, um, I will uh, start by um, telling you more about the background. So successful aging is generally understood as um, aging well um, is a worldwide aim for many people, um, for older adults, for family members, uh, for uh, practitioners, uh, for the community, so many people. And it's one of the ultimate goals of gerontology as well. So when we look into the study of successful aging, we notice that there are two um, sort of perspective on it. So one is the researcher-derived definition of successful aging that usually classified about one-third of older adults as successful ages. But when you ask middle-aged and older adults themselves, over 90% of them will tell you that they're actually doing quite well. Um, and we know that uh, most older adults um, are living with some form of um, chronic conditions or physical disabilities. Um, so the researcher derived definitions of successful aging in the past that often grew out um, uh, having chronic diseases and, and physical disability uh, seems to need an update. Uh, and, and there are also fewer study on the topic in Canada. Um, and uh, when we prepare for the study, um, we look into different concepts of aging well. Um, we actually look into nine of them, like active aging, um, optimal aging, um, and, and healthy aging. And the reason why successful aging was chosen for the study um, was for a few reasons. First of all, it, it has a relatively long history. Um, we have been studying um, successful aging since the 60s, and it's still the most dominant as well as most frequently referred concept of aging well. Um, and it also provides a broader understanding of aging by covering the physiological, psychological, and social aspect of aging. Um, so the study was guided by a synthesized conceptual framework composed of three theoretical perspectives. Um, from Favini's ecological system theory, uh, Young's and Victor, uh, a multi-dimensional model of successful aging, and Kier's concept of complete mental health. So we are going to look into uh, some of the intrapersonal, interpersonal, as well as uh, factors that are um, affecting a person aging well. Um, so for this expanded definition of successful aging, um, it is built on both the objective as well as subjective measures. Um, so it is included no limitations in activities of daily living, um, activity of daily living and instrumental activity of daily living, regardless of the numbers of chronic illnesses um, present and, and freedom from any serious mental illness, um, memory problems, uh, disabling chronic pain, as well as uh, having adequate social support and also the older adults self-reported happiness and their subjective perceptions of their physical health 
mental health as well as aging process. So we, we use the uh, CLSA data, particularly um, some of the, uh, the question to construct the measure of successful aging. So for the uh, limitations in, in the activities of daily living, we look into the ability to dress and undress without help, um, the ability to eat without help, um, the ability to walk with without help or with some help, um, like from another person or the use of a walking aid, um, and getting in and out of bed without help or aid. Um, and for the limitations in the, um, uh, instrumental activity of daily living, we look into the ability to use um, the telephone without help, um, getting to places out um, of walking distance without help, uh, uh, shopping, um, as well as preparing meal, um, doing housework uh, without help um, or with some help, um, taking medication as well as handling money. Um, and for the disabling pain and discomfort, we look into whether the person has any um, um, pain or discomfort that prevent them from doing their uh, usual or daily activities. Uh, for the mental disorder, we look into anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, and memory problems. We, we also look into the mood. Um, we look into whether the person feel uh, depressed all the time, or do they not feel happy or satisfied with life all the time. Um, and for the lack of social support, um, we look into whether the person, you have someone to, um, to talk to when they're in crisis or when they have problems, uh, do they feel that um, they, they feel that they're loved? Um, and the last one was about um, the lack of uh, self-rated wellness, um, how the older adults um, rate themselves in terms of their physical health, uh, their mental health and the aging process. Um, so if, if, the, if they answer no to all these questions, uh, they will be classified as uh, successful ages. Otherwise, they'll be considered as typical ages. Um, so we are not trying to see uh, successful or not, but we are looking into typical as well as successful who, people who are doing exceptionally well. Uh, we want to learn from them and, and see how and, and why they are doing so well. Is there anything we can do to better support other older adults so that we can all live well and age well together? Um, so for the baseline factor, we look into uh, some main factor. Um, it's actually my um, uh, doctoral thesis. It's a three-paper dissertation. So for the main factors, we look into the immigrant status, the marital trajectory, and social participation. So for the demographic uh, factors, we look into the age, the sex, and the, uh, the marital status. We also look into um, education level and um, lifestyle factors and BMI. Um, so for the lifestyle factors, we look into um, um, smoking status, whether they smoke or not, um, and uh, different types of physical activities, as well as whether they have sleeping problems and then how their BMI is. Um, and for the physical disability, we look into a couple of uh, conditions like um, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, arthritis, and osteoporosis. We also look into the finance uh, well-being. Um, so uh, the prevalence of successful aging, um, we, we, it's actually quite interesting. So using the expanded definition of successful aging, we notice that the prevalence of successful aging at time two, uh, we used the baseline as well as the follow-up one data to do the analysis, was about 70.5%, um, which is about more than seven in 10 of those respondents who rate their aging process as good to excellent were identified as successful agents. Um, so in, in a way, we are able to, to draw the gap between the researcher uh, derived definition of successful aging and lay perspective of successful aging closer. Uh, and, and it's a more um, balanced definition of um, successful aging. So for the study population, uh, we use the CLSA data, the CLSA comprehensive cohort, um, and um, especially the, the data from the baseline data, as well as follow-up one data. Um, so the CLSA comprehensive cohort at baseline, um, there were about uh, 30,000 um, respondents. Um, so we, um, we 
um, look into those who were um, aging successfully at baseline and, and were um, 60 years or older at time two. So the final samples were about um, 7,600 plus uh, respondents. So we use SPSS uh, version 28 for all the analysis, uh, bivariates and multivariable binary logistic regression analysis were conducted. Um, so it's a three paper dissertation. So the first paper, we look into the immigrant status. Um, the second paper, we look into the um, uh, marital trajectory. And, um, and the third one, we look into the uh, social participation. And for the first and third paper, uh, which is the one about um, the relationships of um, immigrant status and um, uh, social participations and successful agings uh, were published in, in a special issue uh, in the International Journal of Environmental Research and in Public Health. So for the first paper, um, it was about immigrant status and successful aging. Um, so the, the study examined the relationship between immigrant status and successful aging among older Canadians using the first two waves of STATA from the CLSA. Um, so the immigrant status uh, was measured as a, a dichotomized a variable according to whether the respondent uh, self-identify as uh, being born in Canada or another country. So here are the uh, research questions we have um, for this paper. So do immigrants have a greater prevalence and higher age sex adjacent of successful aging than their Canadian born peers in the, um, uh, the follow-up wave of the uh, CLSA uh, comprehensive court? Uh, what baseline factors, if any, attenuate the association between immigrant status and uh, successful aging? And we also do a separate analysis um, for the immigrants. Um, and, and what baseline characteristics predict successful aging during the follow-up wave. Um, so this is the, uh, the result of the first paper. Um, so we noticed that the Canadian-born older adults had a slightly higher prevalence of aging successfully at time two than their immigrant counterparts. Um, and uh, Canadian-born older adults had approximately 24% higher odds compared to immigrants um, of aging successfully after we have adjusted about 20 additional factors. Um, so we noticed that um, immigrant older adults had a lower prevalence of successful aging than their Canadian born peers. Uh, we definitely need to have more research uh, to investigate better policies and interventions supporting older immigrants and promoting a healthy lifestyle and hence older adults to achieve successful aging in later life. Um, so we suggest that um, perhaps culturally and linguistically appropriate programs and services like acculturation programs, uh, financial aid, um, language problems, uh, language programs, uh, information and referral services may support immigrant older adults to age well. So the second paper was about um, marital trajectories and successful aging. So this one, we would look into um, the association between um, marital status, uh, including trajectory of marital status on successful aging among uh, older men and women. So we look into this um, sex differences. Um, and um, for the marital trajectories, we look into the uh, never married, uh, continuously married, continuously widowed, continuously divorced or separated, um, they, they um, change from um, not married at baseline to marry at uh, the follow up one or the time two, uh, or they um, change from married to not married uh, at time two, and, and other changes as well. So for the research question, um, we had um, our trajectories of marital status associated with successful aging at time two. Um, so after adjusting for 21 baseline characteristic, would that attenuate the association between trajectories of marital status and successful aging? Um, and are there sex differences in the relationship between marital trajectories and successful aging at time two? And which trajectory of marital status are associated with successful aging at time two for males and females? 
Um, so we noticed that the prevalence of successful aging at time two among males and females uh, was similar. Um, the adjusted odd of successful aging was significantly higher among those who were continuously married or became married between the two waves. Um, then the um, adjusted odd of uh, successful aging were significantly higher in females than in males. Um, and um, we, we noticed that there are sex differences. So for the male respondent, we noticed that the significant a positive association between marital status and successful aging were observed um, in respondents who were uh, continuously married, continuously widowed, or became married since baseline when compared to their never married peers. So on the chart, you can see the three uh, red circle here. So for the female respondents, um, we noticed that there were, there were no significant differences with respect to successful aging between never married individuals and any of the other uh, marital categories, with the one exception being that those females who transitioned from married to not married between the two waves um, had just a significantly lower odds of successful aging, which is the, the green circle on the chart. Um, so um, uh, we noticed that um, in comparison to never married older adults, uh, the odd of successful aging were higher for respondents who were continuously married or became married after um, a baseline. And um, the association between the marital trajectories and successful aging differ significantly by sex. Um, so we, we suggest that um, we need to support older adults, especially those who have experienced uh, widowhood, uh, divorce or separation in later life uh, in connecting with others and in developing a social support network. Um, and we also need more uh, research study to understand the rationale behind the observed association. So the, the third paper was about um, social participation and successful aging. So this one, we're particularly looking into six social activities, um, uh, church or religious activities, um, educational um, activities, um, participation in service club, um, neighborhood community activities, uh, volunteer or charity work, as well as uh, recreational activities. So the research questions are, um, do, the, do those who participate in social activities at baseline have a higher prevalence of successful aging at time two? Um, do those who participate in social activities at baseline have higher age, sex, and result of successful aging at time two? And the last question was, does adjusting for 22 baseline characteristics attenuate the association between social participations and successful aging? Um, so we noticed that the prevalence of successful aging at time two was significantly higher in respondents who at baseline participate in, in these activities, um, the, the educational um, or cultural activities, neighborhood, community, or professional association activities, volunteer or charity work, and recreational activities involving other people. So in comparison to those who did not participate in, in these activities, um, the odds of successful aging was significantly higher among older adults who at baseline participate in, particularly, volunteer or charity work, as well as recreational activities. Um, so we know that um, older adults who participate in the, uh, volunteer or charity work and recreational activities were more likely to achieve successful aging than their counterparts who did not engage in these activities. So we suggest that um, perhaps social prescribing in volunteer opportunities and recreational programs may help support older adults' health and well-being. Uh, and, and we definitely need to have more research um, to, to ascertain whether interventions in these areas uh, result in, in increased support of successful aging. So to summarize, um, the study found that respondents who had um, higher odds of successful aging uh, were Canadian born versus an uh, immigrant, um, and they were uh, continuously married or newly married, uh, that they get married between the two waves uh, versus the never married. 
Um, and those who engage in the volunteer or charity work and recreational activities uh, versus those who um, do not uh, engage in, in these activities. Um, and we also look into some of the um, other factors associated with um, successful aging. Um, and we notice that um, some of the uh, demographic and socioeconomic factors um, uh, like um, being younger, and um, uh, being a female and having higher income and being married. Um, but we also notice that there are some modifiable lifestyle and health related factors associated with uh, successful aging, like not being obese um, and um, uh, maintain a healthy body weight, um, engage in um, exercise, uh, physical activities uh, and, and not having sleeping problems uh, and, and free of uh, heart disease or arthritis um, and, and not smoking. So whether it's uh, never smoking in the first paper or not currently smoking. So it's never too late to quit. Um, and, uh, and also not being so solely isolated. So those are some of the um, um, lifestyle and, and health related factors that can be modified. And uh, it's something that we can uh, work on together. So in, in terms of the limitation of the study, um, the study is uh, constrained by um, the variables available in the data set. Um, and it's, um, the data set is, is also uh, disproportionately um, uh, uh, more educated. Um, the respondent, um, like 79.5% of them uh, had uh, post-secondary education compared to uh, about 45% in the population. And interviewed in a CSA, uh, CLSA were conducted in English and French. Um, so the respondent would have um, better um, official language skill. Um, and um, those who do not have the skill might not be able to participate. Um, and also fewer respond, uh, visible minority members in the sample uh, with uh, about 3.6 in the uh, data set compared to about 8.1% in the population. Um, but uh, we, we could not um, examine the cohort effect as, as when I was um, when we start the study, uh, there was only two waves of data available. But now with more data becoming available, we can learn so much about um, uh, the respondent as well as on different topics. Um, and the short span from the baseline to time two, which is about three, four years, um, also restrict the changes in the marital um, trajectory used to explain successful aging. Uh, in a way, we do not know which one comes first. Um, and, and observational nature of the study prohibit the determination of causality. Um, and, and we also have to meet, uh, deal with uh, some of the um, uh, cases with uh, missing entries um, and about uh, 900 plus um, of the cases were excluded from the analysis because of the, uh, the missing data. So for the indication, um, uh, we think perhaps um, culturally and linguistically appropriate programs and services can support um, um, older adults, particularly um, older immigrants. Um, and, and we know that um, they're modifiable, uh, health-related, as well as lifestyle factors. So perhaps we can encourage uh, people to engage into an active and, and healthy lifestyle. Um, but it's not just about uh, healthy eating or doing exercise. We also need to have the support out there to support people to do so. Um, and um, and also the prevention of, of chronic diseases and um, physical disabilities, um, promotion of uh, positive mentality and social connections, uh, how we can support older adults to, to build a social network so that they can get to know more people and, and uh, we can support each other um, and definitely more research and policies and intervention to support older adults to live well and age well. Um, and for future research directions, um, we, we do hope that we'll be able to learn more about the experiences of older visible minority immigrants. Um, we'd love to learn more about um, the experiences of older adults uh, who are never married, or those who are widowed, um, are divorced or separate, uh, particularly in later life, um, what programs and services and how we can better support them. Um, we have been talking about social prescribing. So what about the long-term benefits of social prescribing, particularly to uh, volunteer or charity work, as well as recreational activities? Um, and the fourth one is actually quite interesting. It's the, the fourth paper that uh, we are working on. It's called the Resilient Older Adults. 
because um, when we uh, look into the um, um, the data, we notice that there um, there are people who are always um, typical ages, and there are people who are always doing well, um, and and there are people uh, who were um, are doing well at, at baseline, but not doing as well uh, at um, uh, time two. But then there are people uh, who might not be doing so well at baseline, but they improve over time. So we were wondering what happened to them? Is that something we can learn from them? Um, so we would uh, love to learn more about um, that. That's about um, um, the, the resilience of the adults and, and how we can um, learn from them so that we can all uh, live well and age well. And the last one was more about the, the modifiable lifestyle and health related factors um, and, and, um, and how we can support people to uh, engage into these activities and involve more program um, services, uh, policies, uh, or research uh, are needed. Um, so to conclude, um, the study provide an expanded definition of successful aging um, so is is um, bring the um, the researcher uh, to drive definition of successful aging as well as the lay perspective for successful aging closer together, um, and also provide more understanding of successful aging, um, like um, about um, um, immigrants' status, about marital trajectory, about social participation, um, and um, uh, perhaps policies and interventions um, can better support older adults to, to be well and age well. And definitely we need uh, more uh, research um, to learn more about this, the secret to successful aging. Um, so I, um, I, I really want to um, um, thank everyone at uh, CLSA um, for all the wonderful work. So we have um, all this data um, to do all the analysis and, and findings. Um, and I was provided with the uh, CLSA data for free through the CLSA trainee fee waivers. Um, and I'm also very uh, grateful to my thesis supervisor, Dr. Esme Fuller-Thompson um, of University of Toronto, Dr. Inventash, Faculty of Social Work, uh, for teaching, guidance, support, and inspiration during the entire study. Um, and I'm also very uh, thankful to Dr. David Burns, uh, Dr. Edna Priagams, and, and so many wonderful people that I have met with um, uh, during my uh, my studies. Um, and uh, I do look forward uh, to our conversation so that we can uh, talk more about um, how we can better support older adults to uh, to age well and live well. And um, I also list some of the references um, at, the, at the end of this slide deck. Um, and, um, um, and, and there it is. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Lots of uh, information and hopefully uh, useful information for our participants, both um, researchers, the, the gamut, I think, are part with us today. Um, we have a bunch of questions, so I will um, just sort of start at the top and I will read them and uh, get you to comment on each one and we'll, we'll tick them off as we go. Um, the first one is was BMI based on self-reported height and weight? Also, weight in elderly people does not reflect sarcopenia and fat migration to the central region, um, aka increased visceral adiposity. Were waist circumference measures considered? Right. Uh, yes, we actually used the uh, data from the uh, uh, data set to uh, calculate the, the BMI, um, but definitely there um, a consideration that we need to uh, take into account. But thank you so much for the question. All right. Um, and our next question is, um, she was wondering if those who are not aging successfully might be more likely to drop out of the CLA, CLSA and how whether this might affect the findings. So have you given any thought of that? Right. Um, and we know that uh, the expanded definition of successful aging is, is the um, the, the version as, as is now, um, but uh, we are also looking into other um, things as well. Um, and um, But it's, it's quite interesting that we notice that there are people who are um, typical ages and there are also people who are uh, always doing well or we, we call them the successful ages. So there are people who are um, um, not doing so well with time, but there are also people doing uh, better with time. Um, it's, it's something that uh, we really need to look into um, and, and see how we can better support people to, uh, to live well and age well. 
Um, so I, I do see that there will be uh, um, lots of uh, uh, study and, and papers to work on. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so the next question is, uh, does marital status uh, or does married include unmarried cohabitating couples um, or civil union and common law relationship? Yes, yes. Um, it um, is included in the, uh, the data set in, in the way that they, they, they structure the question. Um, but um, because when we start the study, uh, only two waves of the data were available. So that the short span of time, which is about three to four years, uh, we can't really s explain a lot. Um, so with uh, more CLSA data become available, uh, we do look forward to learning more about the, um, the um, marital trajectories and, and, and how that is related to successful aging. Um, and I think you also answered the next question already, which was how how was Mary married defined, um, and if it was just legally married? Uh, no, it's is uh, uh, uh is is the uh, uh, remember that they have uh, uh, married or common law, and and it's, it's, mm. it depends on how the respondent uh, responds to the question. Right. Um, okay. So the so next one from James. Um, very cool overview. Um, so this is pretty much what we would expect on all fronts, given a huge literature on immigration and health, marriage, gender and health and social networks, participation in health. Could you highlight what you see as uh, any novel contributions, especially our understanding and theories around these constructs and uh, successful aging? In mm -hmm. particular? Um, we are very excited about the, um, the expanded definition of successful aging, because uh, when we look into the literature, um, oftentimes, when we use the um, researchers' derived definitions of uh, successful aging, that usually classify about one third of the older population uh, to be successful ages. But uh, when you ask older adults or, or middle aged people themselves, over 90% of them actually think that they are doing quite well. Um, so, by including the, the self rated wellness into the definition, um, and uh, we are able to um, e expand the, the definition and uh, in include more people. And, and, and it's, it's also a more balanced as well as the more re realistic definition of successful aging. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so now we have many models of successful aging include engaging in, in activities in their definitions, such as row and con. And this is also commonly included in lay perspectives of healthy aging. I was hoping you could speak to why you chose not to include this in your model. Uh, right. Um, so we, we look into different uh, concept of successful aging, um, like um, active aging, optimal aging, uh, healthy aging. Uh, and the reason why we, we, we chose a successful aging, particularly the, the young, the tall, uh, multi-dimensional model of successful aging is because of its um um its um the, the structures of it uh which talks about the um the physiological psychological as well as social aspect of successful aging uh, so that's why we include that in the um um in the conceptual framework uh, to guide the study okay Great. Um, and there's a question, I think it's disappeared, but um, because I think it, there was some other information posted, but it had to do with this being um, the research being very heteronorm heteronormative. And um, if you could speak to um, whether or not any of this research, how uh, uh, the queer population would sort of fit into this or or what we know about that. Yes, yes. Um... Uh, is 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 uh, a three paper dissertation, so that's why we we chose uh, the three topics to work on. Um, but um, the more we look into the data, the more we look into the study, um, the more we notice that there are different areas we need to look uh, into. Uh, definitely, we will look into uh, um, the um, um, a, a successful aging in in different aspect in in the near future. Great. Yeah, I think there's there's lots of uh, lots that can be done. I think is yeah. what a lot of what of what a lot of what you're saying. So great. Yeah. I, I um, see the paper four and five line up. <laughs> so yeah, I know. <laughs> to, to to learn more about the the secret to successful aging, and I do think that um, 
it is, is going to change with time. Uh, and the more we learn about it, um, the more we can provide, um, whether it's policy, program, services, or, or research uh, to support older adults to live well and age well. Definitely, there are so many we can uh, learn from the data set, especially yeah. when uh, more CLSA data is um, becoming available. Yeah. Um, this one's uh, very Canadiana. Is there anything that we can understand specifically about the Canadian context from these data that we couldn't just understand if we were taking our insights from American data? Hmm. Right, right, uh, definitely. I, I would say that uh, the CLS8 is, is a very uh, unique uh, set of data and that um, provide lots of opportunities uh, for studying aging. Um, so we, we do look forward to looking into uh, more of the uh, the Canadian perspective on, on how we can um, support older Canadians to live well and age well uh, in, in the community. Um, and there are, uh, this question is, there are eight social activities in the CLSA data set. Why did you select only six? And how did you determine participation was the threshold based on once per month or once per week? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, we, we look into the um, activities. Um, so when, when we do the analysis, uh, sample size was also a, a, a thing that we need to consider. Um, and um, and because we are not trying to um, look into the the dose effect, um, so we um, we we categorize the um, the answer to participate in those uh, social activities um, yes or no, um, and uh, if they participate in the activities, um, and then we'll um, consider that as as yes. If not, then it's a no, and we will just compare those people who participate in those activities or not. Um, and, and definitely uh, we can look into uh, how those uh, activities um, is, is related to a successful aging uh, and, um, in, in so many other ways. We're, we're just zipping through these questions, very succinct answers. Um, Sarah says, thanks for the presentation. Is there any capacity through this data set to assess um, successful aging for people with cognitive decline or diagnosed dementia? Mm, yes, yes. That's why I've been uh, thinking about too, because um, in, in the past um, over 20 years, I had a privilege to work with uh, people living with dementia. And um, I, I do wonder, hmm, uh, is, is that uh, something we can uh, look into this particular population and, and how we can better support them? Definitely, I, I do look forward to, um, to doing more research on this. Yeah, and, and Sarah, there's um, the CLSA uh, data platform does uh, include a lot of uh, cognitive uh, testing and, and, and data. So I think it's definitely worthy of exploring and there'll be some information at the end of the webinar about um, our data access uh, pr uh, processes and you can always contact us for more information. There's my plug. Um, okay, so the next question is from uh, uh, Jonathan. And it's also the last one. So if anybody has any additional questions, feel please, we do have some more time. So please feel free to post them. Um, so the question is, how did the study compensate for the differences between the sampled population and the general population um, in terms of education, income, immigrants, et cetera, before drawing the study conclusions? Uh, right, right. Um, and um, I, I would say that um, there are lots of um, variable data um, in, in the data set, uh, and we can learn so much uh, from it. Um, and uh, I, I think it would be great if we can do more comparison um, of, of what we have found in the data set, as well as uh, what's out there in the population. Um, so I, I do see lots of opportunity with the uh, CLSA data, and uh, so much we can learn um, from it and, and from working uh, on it. Um, so I, I'm I'm very excited about all this, and I do think that um, um, and and we'll learn so much, uh, and we'll be able to uh, um, work with um, everybody and uh, older adults uh, practitioner, so that we can truly support older adults to live well and age well. Right, um, and also just to note that the CLSA does does uh, look at uh, sample weights and. Uh, sort of a comparability to the general population. So there is some some literature um, about that if you wanted to look into that. Okay, so we have some more questions coming through. Um, 
uh, you framed your contribution specifically in terms of expanding our understanding of ex successful aging. Do you feel you can make any contributions to our understanding of social engagement ne networks, or are you using most it mostly as a setting for your outcome measure? Mm. Um, um, for for the for the um, three papers, we noticed that. Um, being able to connect with others is actually very important. Um, so, um, and um, whether it's um, um, social participation, particularly the one about recreational activities is um, with other people. So that's why um, being able to connect with other people and expand the social network would be um, an important factor. So I do look forward to uh, learning more about um, how we can um, learn more about how we can better support um, older adults to um, to expand their social network, and um, if if there is any programs or services that we can do uh, to better support that. Great. Um, and will future studies include specific immigrant subgroups? So is this on your uh, list of things to study? Yeah. It's it's on my. Uh... <laughs> Coming 20 years, so I'm very excited about all this, but uh, it, it also depends on, on what is available um, in, in the data set, though. Um, but oftentimes when we are doing the analysis, we know that there are some, um, sometimes we encounter like small sample size that we might not be able to uh, to go on. But um, I, I think with um, um, more data becoming available, um, we will be able to uh, do so much. Um, and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this question, so maybe I can help, but what is the percentage of Indigenous people, people's data in the CLSA database? I'll let you help me then. Yeah, okay. I, I And uh, Seema, I actually don't know the exact answer, but I do know um, Amy is typing some information right now that she can share with you. Um, the CLSA uh, does have a... Um, a does have Indigenous identifiers as part of our data set. And if you'd like more information about that, um, please feel free to reach out to us and we can give you that information. All right. Um, okay, so could a study, see the questions keep coming in if there's time. Uh, could, a, could a future study include the role of pets in successful aging of pet owners? Love yeah. that question. <laughs> about that too. I was uh, talking to some of my colleagues about um, uh, uh, this and uh, my, my colleagues uh, is, is, a, is a cat person. So uh, she was wondering, hmm, so what about the, the role of, of pets? Uh, it's, it's like a family members to many people. Um, and um, if, if there are questions in the data set, I, I would definitely look into it and, and wonder um, if, if we have uh, some good findings uh, related to that. Thank you so much. It's a great question. Um, and uh, was your study done with participants from across the CLSA or only certain groups or certain regions? Uh, we used the, uh, the CLSA comprehensive court, um, but uh, we look into those um, who were um, classified as successful ages at baseline and, and they reached the age of 60 at time two. Um, so that's how we uh, could constrict the, uh, the sample. Um, and uh, the final sample for all the three papers were about uh, 7,600 plus. Yeah, so so I presume that would have, you didn't um, look at in, uh, provincial differences or regional differences, so everyone was looked at together. Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, where are we? Andrea, did you consider everyone born outside of Canada as immigrant, irrespective of length of time here? Or did you differentiate based on how long ago they immigrated? Right, uh, we also did uh, different analysis on, on that. Um, and um, the uh, immigrant status uh, was a, a self-reported question. So they answer whether they're uh, Canadian born or whether they're born in another country. Um, but we also look into the, the length of immigration. Um, it's quite a high number, uh, about over 70% of the immigrants uh, actually came in, in to Canada for over 40 years. Um, but still, we, we see the differences um, um, of the um, uh, aging successfully. Um, so definitely, we need to look uh, more into the experiences of uh, older immigrants and how we can better support them. Okay, great. 
Wow, that was I felt like that was like a, a rapid fire Q and A session. Oh, I, uh, I we got too, yeah. <laughs> um, something is happening with my monitor. Um, as a note, uh, the pet ownership issue is complicated, and uh, James has posted a uh, um something for everyone to learn from. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think what I will do is again, like I said, that was a rapid fire, pretty intense question and answer. So we may uh, finish a little bit early. Um, if another question comes in while I'm wrapping up, we can always uh, uh stay on to address it at the end. Um, so I guess I want to thank you again to uh, uh Dr. Ho for being our presenter today. We greatly appreciate your participation. Um, and thank you to all the attendees of the webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that the deadline for data access applications for use of the CLSA data platform is January 17th of 2024. Uh, please visit the CLSA website under data access to review the, the data that's available as well as additional details about what the applica application process entails. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone about your um, survey upon exiting the session today so that we can learn about um, uh, the topics that interest you and, and how well we're doing, hopefully. Uh, and next, um, our next webinar. So this will be an exciting one as well. So our first webinar of 2024 uh, will be uh, assessing as accessing linked CLSA data at HDRN Canada data centers. Um, it will be presented on Wednesday, January 17th at 20. Uh, Wednesday, January 17th at noon. So same day the data access applications are due. Um, registration details are posted on our website uh, as well as in the chat box that uh, Amy is monitoring. Um, and I guess the last thing to say is, is if you're a... Uh, uh, if you're a, a, a Twitter or a tweeter, uh, remember that the CLSA uh, promotes this webinar using the hashtag CLSA webinar. So please feel free to share it. And we, we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So thank you again for everyone who attended today. And if there's any follow-up questions, I'm sure uh, Dr. Ho will could follow up with you. Her email was posted in the chat. And this webinar will also become available on the CLSA website, website for anyone to um, access after. Great. So thank you all. Enjoy the day and uh, have a restful few weeks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.